are the Beatle people the best people? Well, you know, I'm kind of biased, but <laughs> yes, they are. <laughs> So welcome back to another episode of Explain Yourself. We're still at the Entomological Society meeting and this is Vinicius and he's agreed to talk to us about his research and grad school experiences. I'm really excited about this interview. So thank you so much for talking to us about all yeah. of the things you do. You're welcome. Uh, I always like to start everybody off. Can you give us the elevator pitch, the real short speech for your current research? So I'm a PhD research and I am studying a group of beetles called Lycidae. Okay. They are, as my advisor likes to say, the modest relatives of Lampyridae, which is the family of beetles that have lights on their uh, on the epic on the apex of their abdomen. The right. So fireflies. Yeah, fireflies are some people call them lightning bugs. Lightning yeah, bugs okay. and fireflies. All right. And so I'm currently working describing new species and trying to understand the evolutionary relationship of beetles of this specific family. And and even more specific, the group of beetles that I work right now, the adult males they're just like any other regular beetle. Say okay. they will have wings, long antennae, and they will be flying around. Mm -hmm. And the adult females, they will just be like a, a, a larva. Okay, so they, so they they look like larva, but they're adults They're adults. So the adult okay. females, they, their morphology are just like from the larva. Okay, so if I picked one up, I wouldn't be able to tell the difference. You wouldn't be able to tell the difference between the larva and the adult female from okay. this group. And that's one of the main things that I'm trying to find out. How do you tell apart the adult females mm -hmm. from the larva? And that sounds familiar because if anybody's heard of a glow worm before, that's like the female of a lightning bug and they're similar, right? Like they don't have wings and move around. So that's another way that those two groups are related? Correct. Okay. Correct. Alrighty. And when you say that yours are the most more modest version, they don't have light up butts. Yeah, uh, I, I, I wasn't sure if I could say butt. Yeah, that's sure. Why I took some... We can say butt. I talk about poop all the time. <laughs> that's fine. So, no, it's just a joke. Yeah. It's, it's just that they are very similar. If, if a known expert mm -hmm. look at them, uh, they are very similar. Their anatomy and morphology. Fireflies and the Lycidae, their common name is net wing beetle. So some okay. of, some of, some people might know this common name. Common names are not that common in other places as they yeah. are here in the United States. So <laughs> I'm still learning the common names of beetles. That's all right. Yeah. And I noticed when I saw your talk yesterday that some of the males had very, um, very fancy antennae. Yes, is but specifically on this, specifically on this group that I'm studying right now, mm -hmm. some of the males they have these very fancy, elaborate antennae, and we think that. This is a way for the males to find the females because you you, you have to think the, the adult males they are just like other beetles sure. so they're flying around yeah. and the females because they're like uh, larvae they will be on the ground and so they they're are hard to find they're hard to okay. find and they're probably releasing some sort of pheromone or other chemicals and the males are literally using their antennae to tune that. Okay, so they're sniffing out the females. Exactly. Okay, cool. Alrighty. Um, so again, from your talk, I learned that, um, so these females, they look like the babies and the species that have been described so far have really been described by what males there are and not by the females, and you're working on trying to match the females with the males? Yeah, okay, so first thing, it's not just one species, so it, it's a complex of species. Okay. So we have about, so far, 31 species described on that wow. group. Wow, okay. So we have 31 named species in that group. Mm -hmm. And now the descriptions, or which people like to call, like, we discovered new species. Yeah. So all those species, they are based on the males. Okay. And, and people don't know how the females are. Okay. So I'm trying to, first, I'm expanding the number of species described. Okay. And I'm trying to associate the females with the males. So how do you match them up? So what are we gonna do about associate, association males and females? We're using a gene called CO1. Okay. Which is a mitochondrial gene and they are fairly, they are highly conservative if you compare it to other genes. And so conservative means that it It doesn't, doesn't change, change as yeah. much when you compare it to other genes. Okay. So we're, we're uh, 
choosing these genes, CO1, and as we we're talking about, as we want to associate males and females from the same species, that gene will be the same on both species, okay. males and females. Yeah. Even though they have a very different morphology and anatomy, mm -hmm. uh, their genes are very similar. Okay. 90 five percent or more similar. So rather than being a gene that affects what the insect looks like, it's probably a gene for like um, something internal, right? Like something about their internal body chemistry or? Well, I don't know about the importance or relevance for <laughs> CO1 for mm -hmm. um, the physiology or any other thing for beetles. Okay. Because this is not a, a thing that I okay, so really Okay, so it's just something that you're using yeah. as a marker. We, we know that this is a good marker mm -hmm. and it's a good thing to associate different stages, so immature stages of butterflies, for example. Okay. If you have a caterpillar and, and you don't know what is the adult, right. you will have an you have this gene and you can associate them using this. Okay, yeah. So this is the first step. Later on, uh, once we have the, the match mm -hmm. using the CO1, we want to do the same, but with the morphology. Ah, okay. And then a anyone will be able to do this without expending hundreds of dollars. <laughs> so the idea is to use the CO1 mm -hmm. for the first match. Okay. And after this, we will be able to say, oh, okay, so this is the female. Now let's see if there's enough anatomical and morphological variation okay. that we can use to okay. associate it. So is that, um, I know a lot of people when they're trying to do species description um, in insects, they use the genitalia. Is that a direction that you would be going is like matching up um, female and male genitalia and how they fit together? So, the <laughs> the, tech, the taxonomy word is kind of sexist, oh. and depending on the group, uh, you would make the entire classification uh, and distinguish one species from another based on the male genitalia. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, for for the lysity, it's very true. Okay. So for the lysity, um, you can tell apart very similar species uh, just looking at their genitalia. Hmm. Okay. But I'm not sure if I answer your I mean, question. That's like, I, I guess I was wondering, like, are are they sort of like puzzle pieces that like the male genitalia fit into the female genitalia in a way that you can like match them up species-wise that way as well? It's possible. Okay. Theoretically, it's possible, but it's it's not. I don't think it's doable. Okay, so it's not like a perfect fit or whatever. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's because they're, we're talking about really small structures. Yeah. And I don't know if people would fund it. <laughs> that's, that's fair. <laughs> and I mean, the, the CO1 is really cheap. Yeah. The CO1 is really cheap and mm -hmm. really fast and pretty straightforward. And people have been doing this for a few years. So we're pretty sure that this works okay. for this purpose. That's fair. Nice. Um, so you are doing all of this work in which country? You're looking at the beetles in the rainforests in, I don't remember, was it Costa Rica, Puerto Rico? Okay, so I am, um, so my base town, how do you say this, base town? Yeah, sure. Your town. So I'm currently living in Bozeman, Montana, mm -hmm. and the, the Lycity, the group that I'm working with, mm -hmm. they're called Leptolicini. Just give a name to it. Yeah. <laughs> so instead of keep saying the group that I'm work yeah, with. So, right. <laughs> so the Leptolicini, they are uh, a tribe of insects. So you have the the family, mm -hmm. and then the families are subdivided in in subfamilies, and mm -hmm. then subfamilies are again subdivided in tribes. Welcome to the world of taxonomy. Yeah, and, <laughs> and eventually it will be subdivided in subtribes. Yeah. So in this case, we're talking about tribe mm -hmm. Leptolicini. So the Leptolicini, they have a neotropical distribution. Okay. So that means we're talking about uh, part of Mexico, uh, the cent Central America, the Caribbean islands, okay. and South America. Mm -hmm. And they occur in all those places. Alrighty. So part, we receive material from several collections in the world, over 25 collections in the world. Wow. And I was recently, as you saw in my talk, in Puerto Rico for okay, my field work. Yeah. Um, 
so that's their distribution. Nice. Okay. And it, and you said you received samples from other collections, so you have people collaborating with you. So you don't always have to go out and collect all of the insects you're studying. Sometimes other people find them and send them to you. Yeah, actually, so I don't know if you mentioned that, but there's scientific collections, they work as libraries. Yeah. So scientific collections are, are like libraries, and when you need a book, you go to that library and they will borrow that to you. Mm -hmm. It's pretty much the same thing for insects, so when we need uh, a specific insect, we go there and ask, hey, I am studying these beetles or these flies or mm -hmm. whatever it is, can you please send me those specimens as a loan? And then they will send those specimens to you and um, we will study them, do whatever we have to do, mm -hmm. and when we're done, we send it back to that collection. Oh, nice, okay, yeah, that's a, yeah. A and of course, there's, there are so many new species out there, you have to limitate what you're asking for. Sure. Yeah. So you usually say, I'm working with uh, beetles from the family Scarabaidae, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, from a specific subgroup, yeah. for example, the dung beetles. Yep. I would not want all the scarabs ever because that's way too many. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> so you say, can you please send me all your dung beetles that have these characteristics? Yeah. And then the curators, which are the people who take care of the collections, will send the specimens to you. Fantastic. Yeah. So they have an amazing job and we should all be very grateful to them. Yes, thank you museum collections. They are super important. You are. Support your local museums. Yes. Yeah. Um, all right, so like you said, your home base or where you're doing your doctoral research mm -hmm. is Bozeman, Montana, but you have an interesting story of your journey to get to that place. So can you tell us more about uh, how you decided to become a scientist and how you decided to go to grad school and how you wound up in Montana? Yeah, sure, <laughs> sure. So since I was a kid, I always liked insects and arthropods and I was really afraid of them because I didn't understand them. Okay. And I remember I used to go to, to my grandma's house in, in, when we were in the summer mm -hmm. or for summer here in the United States. It was the winter in Brazil. Okay. <laughs> and um, her house was always full of beetles flying around and I was so scary of them. <laughs> <laughs> I was like super afraid because I didn't understand them. Mm -hmm. and, and since then I become obsessed with beetles and I said I want to study beetles. I want to study why are there are so many beetles and they are so pretty, they are so interesting. And then I decided to go to and, and be a biologist and later on became an entomologist. So I did my bachelor's degree in a small college in Brazil. Mm -hmm. It's called uh, Universidade Cruzeiro do Sul. And then later on, um, I started my master's in systematics, animal biodiversity, and taxonomy. Mm -hmm. And there I started to be trained as a entomologist slash taxonomist, okay. which is a person who describes new species and is interested in the evolutionary relationships of insects. Mm -hmm. And then you wanted me to talk again about the... Yeah, so like how did you, because that was all in Brazil, right? So, yeah, tell, so us, tell us the story of how you jumped from Brazil up to okay. Montana. <laughs> so I was developing my career in Brazil. I had several good contacts there. I, was, I, I met several curators. And then my advisor, Clay de Costa, a female scientist, really good scientist, she is also, she's an expert in click beetles, Ooh. beetles from the family Elateridae. Mm -hmm. So they, they have lights on their pernodon, their back. Yeah, those are awesome. <laughs> yeah, and she, she's an expert in Elateridae and she was also an expert, she's an expert in immature insects. Okay. So she was interested in, in the larvae, and pupae, and how the insects will metamorphose, mm -hmm. me, do their metamorphosis. Yeah. And then, she said, Vinicius, we will have this meeting in Czech Republic. It's called the Immature Beetles Meeting, where there will be lots of people talking about immature beetles. Yeah. <laughs> They'll be talking about larvae and pupae and how cool they are. And I really want you to go there. And at that time, we were describing, a, for the first time, the larva of a species of Lycidiff from Brazil. Okay. Uh, the species is Metapteron chantamela. I'll send you the name later. Yes. <laughs> and um, she was insistent to me 
to go to that meeting. And I said, no, Clady, this is so expensive. I don't have a lot of money. <laughs> and she said, and she keep insisting. I said, go, go there. That will be good for your career. You will meet different people. You will be exposed to int the international community mm -hmm. working with Beatles. And I said, yeah, okay, let's, let's do this. You've been in this business for a long time. You probably know what you're talking about. <laughs> And then that was amazing. That was the first time I was uh, traveling abroad. Uh, first time I was in a in a different country, Ooh. speaking English to no native English speakers, mm -hmm. to and being exposed to the international community. So I was all shaky. <laughs> Because talking at a conference isn't scary enough to start with. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and and people were very nice. They were very interested in what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And that was the place where I met my now advisor here in Montana, Michael Ivey. Mm -hmm. And that's that's how wow. I, I end up here in the United States. <laughs> so after this. Uh, he, I wrote to him and asked if he was interested in receiving me to be a, a PhD student in mm -hmm. his laboratory. And here I am. It's quite a story, yeah. It's very interesting. <laughs> but it sounds like um, it sounds like you've had a lot of good advisors that have sort of like helped you grow as a scientist. Yes, I think um, having a good advisor, a person who supports your career and and help you make some choices um, it's a critical a critical part of being a scientist mm -hmm. well first you, you must have the support of your family <laughs> that too. Be, because without it it's it's nearly impossible second um, your advisors mm -hmm. because and I learned this is sometimes you we don't see very well because of our inexperience so the advisors are, are there exactly to to help you with yeah. those problems. To guide us. To Thank guide you, us. Advisors. Yes, yes. <laughs> and even though sometimes it's very hard to admit it, several times they're they're right and we're wrong. So. Yeah. <laughs> Just like parents. Just yeah. like par it's, it's sort of <laughs> parenting. Yeah. Um, so with that in mind. Um, because you're still kind of early in your career, you're working mm -hmm. on your PhD. What do you think is the thing that you still need to work on the most as you are developing into a scientist? <laughs> wow, that's a that's a hard. It one. is. What people have been saying about it? Um, other people. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> then, don't, don't say oh, anything. Okay. Yeah. It is a hard question. I think it's a hard question because I have so many things that I think I need to work on. <laughs> well, that's it. Well, the first thing is. Okay, so there are a few things that I think are important. So the first one, I think we must learn to cooperate with different people, especially in this field. Uh, being a systematist and a taxonomist, mm -hmm. you 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 have to rely on your networking with different people. So um, always be friendly to everyone. Always offer your help, and yeah. whenever someone needs help, I think we should be there to help them. So the first thing would be um, work on your networking because this is really important, and that's the reason why we go to conferences and meetings. It's not just because we want to get drunk. And, and hang out, uh, y y you are um, building your network in there. Mm. And this is really important yeah. because you have connections um, and people will know where you can go to get some information or get a specimen or, or whatever. So work on my networking and, and I always try to find new technologies and mm. ways of extracting data and information from from our specimens as a systematist yeah. because taxonomy and systematics is a very classical thing and most scientists in this field of area they are heavily relying on morphology which is a very good tool yeah. uh, but there are other things that can supplement our use of morphology so I'd say that for me first thing networking and second um, you you must always try to find 
new technologies and new ways of extracting data from yeah. your specimens. Yeah, because technology is always improving. Correct. So, yeah. I mean, what we're doing now in five minutes would take probably several hours 20 years ago. Yeah. I mean, even this video here, it would, <laughs> it would require several people working with you. So. Yeah, that's true. Um, so those were good things. What do you think is the thing that you are the best at already as a scientist, or like your best scientist quality? <laughs> <laughs> My best scientist quality? Mm -hmm. Wow, that's a hard one. <laughs> I, never, I never thought about it. Have you ever thought about it? Um, I, yeah, I mean, sometimes. I, I like to focus on what I need to work on because that's a longer list. <laughs> so, make again the question. Um, what do you think is the thing about yourself mm -hmm. that is, like, it's something that makes you a good scientist? Like, well, I don't know if I have anything that specifically makes me a better or a good scientist, mm -hmm. but I have a... And I don't know if I'm that good at doing this, but I, I try <laughs> to do this, which okay. is being an organized person. Ah. So I try to be very organized, not always, but it, it but <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to, to be organized. So yeah. when you were uh, at, at, our, at this point of our careers as grad students, you have several appointments. So you have to teach, mm -hmm. you have papers to review, you have papers to write, you have to study for your exams. Mm -hmm. So uh, you, and you have your personal life, yeah. which is very important. We cannot <laughs> yes. forget it. Um, so I think be organized, have a schedule of activities or and reserve a free time for for your sanity. <laughs> and, and this is a good lesson. So this is the thing that I would like to say to talk about. So when I was in an undergrad, I was mm -hmm. I wanted so much to learn about insects and evolution, and I said I I cannot have time to have fun. I just I just have to oh. study and do my best. And of course, it didn't last forever because we're humans and we need to rest. So mm -hmm. I would say that being an organized person and reserve some time to do the things that you're doing. And I appreciate that. I think that's a really good point. Uh, Work-life balance is something that a lot of people are starting to talk about more. And yeah, it's really important because if we don't take breaks, we burn out and that makes us not good scientists. And uh, I, I, there's a thing that is always a very good exercise is when you try to explain your research to your grandmother. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or to your, to your uncle or to your aunties. So it's always a very nice chance of you exercising like how am I going to translate all those scientific sci scientific and very complicated um, terminology mm -hmm. to a, a common language so yeah those are very interesting things to think about it is yeah um, so you talked about your family and where you grew up and you have a little bit different backstory you're the first person that I've interviewed who hasn't grown up in the United States so how has your how has that sort of affected your experiences in the scientific community and what would you like other people with a background like yours to know about being in science well, so the first thing is that it sounds like a cliche, but you you need to put a lot of hard work on whatever you're doing and be focused and put some time on that. Mm -hmm. So this is the first thing. And the second thing is that um, you, you're you just out there and you have your chances by lucky. <laughs> but... Um, I think you have to look for the luck, though. Well, the, looking for luck is like the consequences of uh, of the hard work. The hard work. Yeah. So, yeah. So I'd say I came from a really small college, then I, I jumped to my masters in one of the best places in the country, and I'm here in the United States mm -hmm. doing a research with uh, good resources. So my message here is just a lot of hard work. Um, and do your best. Yeah. 
be the best you, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, the best of, you know, your limits and always try to learn more. It's, it's pretty cliche. Yeah. I, but it's important for people to hear. You, you can hear that so many times, but it doesn't necessarily sink in just because you're hearing it all yeah, the time. Yeah, <laughs> I, I really think it's just, about, it's all about hard work and a little bit of lucky. Yeah. Um, so I loved that you said you were both fascinated by and a little afraid of insects and that's what made you want to study them. But, and I know this is going to break your heart, what if somebody came up to you right now and said, Vinicius, stop, you can never study insects or arthropods ever again. What would you study instead? Jellyfish. <gasps> Ooh. I love jellyfish. That's a great answer. <laughs> I love jellyfish. What do you love about them? Uh, I just like them. They're pretty. They're awesome. And I just don't study jellyfish because uh, I think you don't have a, a lot of morphology to do. And I really like morphology and <laughs> touching the specimen and yeah. looking into the details. Uh, so it's not very healthy to touch jellyfish. <laughs> no, yeah. Did you know that um, if, the more you work with a particular species, the more allergic you become to them? Seriously. To different jellyfish? Yeah. I didn't know. Because the sting is a protein. I didn't know. So, yeah. Isn't that crazy? Wow. <laughs> so jellyfish. Yeah. So, yeah. I like that. So you want to stick with things that don't have spines. Yes. I yeah. love, in, I, I, I like invertebrates as uh, in general. Mm -hmm. uh, I always like beetles and insects, but I, I love invertebrates. So I really like it. Me too. Invertebrates are awesome. Yeah, they're yeah. very interesting. Alrighty, so what is your favorite thing about the research you do? So the most rewarding thing about my research is that when I look to a beetle, especially from to a lycidae, mm -hmm. and I look to that and I can name it, so I can address to that. So what really gives me lots of pleasure is looking to a beetle and knowing the name of that. Okay, so you like to know. I like to know to a beetle and say, hey, I know that this is Calopteron terminale. Mm -hmm. So that's the thing that gives me most pleasure in this research. Okay, cool. It's even more rewarding knowing the name of a species than describing a species, mm. in my opinion. Wow, interesting. Okay. Because there are so many species out there waiting to be discovered, yeah. to be dis described, but it's so rare when you can get a beetle and or whatever you're studying and give a name to that. <laughs> I think that's that's important because a lot of people don't realize just how many insects there are that haven't been discovered and described. Yeah. So yeah, like there are probably more that don't have names than those that do. Yeah, so I will make up the numbers here and you can add it later, <laughs> but there are, you know, there's, there are about one million species of animals described sure, out there, yeah. more or less. Yeah. And then about 400 or 500,000 are beetles. Mm -hmm. So beetles are the largest group of animals in number of species yep. uh, in the world. And even I am studying the beetles of the family Lycidae, which is considered to be a small family, and we have about 5,000 named species. <laughs> and this is a, f a small family. Oh. <laughs> do, 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 yeah. do you know how many species of birds are out there? Yeah, no, it's not nearly that many. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I bet it's under 10,000. I think Or so, a little bit, yeah. over a little bit. Yeah. But. So I'm studying a group with. Uh, a small group of beetles, only 5,000 species. So there are a lot of beetles out there. Yeah. Um, so since you are describing new species, this mm -hmm. is one of the cool things about being a systematist and taxonomist. How do you decide what to name the new species? Well, in my case, and <laughs> <laughs> I like to name species after people. Okay. So. Like who? So, for example, um, the f I described the species after my grandmother, Aww. my sweet grandmother. Um, so her name is Vera Cruz, mm -hmm. and I described a species called Falsokinia veracruzae. Oh, that's so sweet! Yeah. I love that. So another species <laughs> I described after my former advisor, mm -hmm. so Acroleptus costei. Her name is Clay de Costa, so mm -hmm. you'll make up a Latin like the with the ending. last name, yeah. so Costai, 
is a Latin form of Costa. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I like to name after people. That's so sweet. Eventually, if you have a, a very distinct characteristic, mm -hmm. for example, I described the species um, where the species had um, yellow hair. Mm. So I named the species after that characteristic. So yeah. it was called Colidodes um, flavicetti. Okay, and then the flavicetti means, means something about the means yellow hair in oh, Latin. Cool. Okay. But so you so you pretty much can name it after your mom, your cat, whoever you want. But <laughs> I personally like to describe and name it after people. Okay. Yeah. I think it's a way of make making that person live in forever in the literature. So it's That's fair. <laughs> is that like, when, when you write the paper where you describe the new species, is that like how you decided on the name? Is that part of the story? Or do you just kind of say, well, this is the name and yeah. Well, it depends on the case. So what, what's very common is, um, let's say you were in the Amazonian forest mm -hmm. and you found a unique new species and you collected it mm -hmm. and you handled that to me and said hey Vinicius here's a new species oh you don't know that's a new species sure, here's yeah. the here's the specimen do you know what it is and then I'll go there and say oh my god it's a new species and you collected that mm -hmm. so I'll go as a courtesy and describe it after you oh okay sure yeah, yeah. so what several people will ask me is that so when you describe a species can you name it after you after yourself. <laughs> yeah. No, no, you can't do that. That's not very modest. It's not very modest. <laughs> and after all, your name will be there. Doesn't sure, matter. Yeah. Because um, when you describe a species for animals, um, so you have the genus and the species, mm -hmm. and then you have the author, the yeah. person who described it, and the year when that was described. Yeah. So your name will be there. Doesn't matter what. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> That's fair. Um, Recently, people have been describing species after uh, show, char uh, TV shows, characters, or celebrities. Or celebrities. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, th I think all forms are valid as long as they are describing new species. They are making that uh, call people's attention. Mm -hmm. It's a way of people get interested in that. And there are so many species yet to be described that we should get creative so we don't run out of names, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. <laughs> Um, so my little wrap-up question then is what is sort of next in your future? Where do you think you're going past this point? As a scientist? Yeah. Not not physically, location-wise. No, I see, yeah. I see. <laughs> I need to go to the bathroom, yeah, no. <laughs> brush my teeth. <laughs> well, I mean, at this point is, I think, find a job. Okay. <laughs> do you want to work in academia? Do you want to work for, you know, in industry? So find a job and I would like to be, to work in the academia. I would like to work uh, with systematics or taxonomy and teaching. Um, I, f I am really, really interested in natural history museums, uh, problems and new strategies and new ways of extracting information from old specimens deposited in the museums yeah. uh, besides my taxonomical career. So I w I'm interested in those questions so I'm going to look forward to keep working on those subjects. Awesome. Well, we wish you the best of luck with that. So thank you, thank you again so much, Vinicius, for talking to us about your research and sharing some fun stories. It was a lot of fun to talk to you. So thank, thank you. you. Um, if you liked this video, don't forget to like it. If you didn't like this video, please share it with someone who would. And if you'd like to support The Roving Naturalist, don't forget to hit the subscribe button and the bell icon so that you can get notifications when I post new videos. You can also follow me on Facebook and Twitter, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.